Democrats and other insults to American intelligence are calling for common sense gun legislation to go with their common sense defunding of the police and their common sense end to crime prosecution so that common sense criminals can commit common sense atrocities without being stigmatized by imprisonment or common sense. President and venal houseplant Joe Biden pushed the common sense flapdoodle in a speech before concerned citizens in favor of surrendering all their liberties in a mindless panic or CCFSLMP, an anti-gun group of concerned citizens who support surrendering all their liberties in a mindless panic, as the name implies. As the group's members ran back and forth across the room, waving copies of the New York Times and shrieking in hysterical terror, the presidential potted palm said, quote, We need to have background checks, which we already have, so we can restrict access to assault weapons, which don't exist, and automatic weapons, which are already restricted, in order to make people feel that a crisis they think is happening when it isn't is being dealt with seriously when it's not. If we don't pretend to act now, innocent people all over this country might come to their senses and start to wonder why a gallon of gas costs $16 and you can't find baby formula to feed your 15-year-old son who's wearing a teddy bear costume and a dress. After all, many experts I just invented have told me that a 9 millimeter bullet can blow your lungs right out of your body, as opposed to a 22, which will simply lodge in your brain so the doctors can save your life, although afterwards you'll sound a lot like me. What do you need those kinds of weapons for? Deer don't wear Kevlar vests, for God's sake. It's not like the old days when deer were running around in all kinds of get-ups, many of them carrying flintlocks so that the Founding Fathers had to pass the Second Amendment to protect the buffaloes who were being blown into extinction by all those armed deer. I mean, buffaloes don't wear Kevlar vests, for God's sake. They're buffaloes. They don't know any better. That's why the Indians weren't allowed to have cannons, or Native Americans as we call them today, even though that doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about it. But the Native Americans had bows and arrows, and that's what we should have, especially those plastic arrows with the rubber tips. Those things will blow the lungs right out of your body. So we're right back where we started, and it's all because of those lousy Indians. That's why we need more common sense. Unquote. At the end of the president's speech, the group rushed from the room in a mindless panic and declared they would stage a march on Washington (laughs) to demand that all their constitutional rights be destroyed so they could finally calm down. The march will be attended by pop star Selena Gomez, who is considered by many a triple threat to to music. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to music, drama, and American liberty. Miss Gomez will sing her new song entitled, If You Happen to Be an Idiot, which begins with the lyrics, I'm a pop star with an opinion, and that really matters a lot. As the anti-gun outcry spread from one end of the CNN newsroom to the waste paper basket under Brian Stelter's desk, Republicans responded by unveiling a two-point plan as follows. One, work with Democrats to develop common sense gun legislation. Two, lose every election from now until Jesus returns, including the midterms, which they would have won by a landslide if they hadn't worked with Democrats on common sense gun legislation and instead just kept reminding people that gas costs $19 a gallon because it's already $3 more expensive than it was two paragraphs ago. Meanwhile, Democrats in Congress returned to work developing their common sense plan to bring down prices by taxing corporations so that prices go up, and their common sense plan to make the sun cooler by extracting energy from a unicorn's ass. (laughs) They're also working on common sense legislation to prevent Americans from using dictionaries where they can look up the meaning of the words common sense. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. Hunky donkey, life is tickety boo. Birds are winging, also singing. Hunky donkey doo. Ship shaped, ipsy topsy. The world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day. Hurrah, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hurrah! All right, we're literally laughing our way through the fall of the republic. That's a prom- A promise is made, promise is kept. Uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, transgenderism and why the Prince of Lies now identifies as a princess. Uh, Amber Heard and Johnny Depp, uh, we'll talk about them, though they're not talking about us. And we'll take a special look at comedians, the anti-woke and the anti-funny. And listen, let me just pause here for just a minute to ask you again. I don't know if you are watching backstage a couple of days ago, but we're really pushing the subscription right now because we need, we need help doing the stuff we're doing. We brought out What is a Woman? I'm going to tell you about what happened, the way the left tried to shut, literally tried to shut us down. I mean, actually tried to sabotage the uh, the site 
but we need you to help us because we never know when uh, we're going to get support. We want we know if you're supporting us, your support will hold. So go to whatisawoman.com, subscribe, you get 25% off. It's I know some of you, if you can't afford it, you can't afford it, I get it, but it's only, it's only like 10, 11 bucks a month. So uh, go on there, subscribe. It's what makes it possible for us to do the stuff we do. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast and leave us a five-star review. Also help for, for the show, to support the show. And of course, subscribe to the Andrew Clavin YouTube channel, my personal YouTube channel where you will get exclusive content that's not on the show if you ring that little bell uh, repeatedly until you get a, a sore wrist and your mouse breaks. Uh, and if you leave a comment there and that comment is just indescribably disgusting, we will include it on the show because we have to fill time and it sounds like just the rest of the show. Paper Mario... Paper Mario 14. So, oh, I was talking about, uh, was it Good Ranchers? We were doing the rap, the rap uh, song, and I said, I need a rap star name. Uh, Paper Mario says, e- easily Andrew Clavin's rap name should be AK-67. Uh, his initials, age, and a gun pun, also representative of his creative, incredible writing. Well, thank you uh, for that. That's what Alfonso Rachel used to call me. He used to call me AK-47. Uh, the problem with calling me AK-67 is, like, every year I have to change it. So summer is a coming, and I am talking about where I'm going to go on vacation with my wife, and I'm sure you're planning vacation, and you're going to want your uh, ring doorbell, so if anybody comes to your door, you can talk to them no matter where you are on the app, but you also want the protection of ring alarm. And you're saying, whoa, ring makes an alarm? Yes, it does. You're probably not saying that, but it's true. Ring does make an alarm. It's an award-winning home security system with available professional monitoring when you subscribe. You can easily install it yourself. And Ring didn't stop there. They've changed the home security game with Ring Alarm Pro. When it comes to protecting your home, you should go pro with Ring Alarm Pro. It's a next level security system. CNET calls Ring Alarm Pro a giant leap for home security. Ring combined a home security system and a Wi-Fi router, so it helps protect your home and secure your network. And with a Ring Protect Pro subscription, it's an amazing deal. You get professional monitoring for the ultimate peace of mind. You may not have known it, but it's true. Ring has an award-winning alarm, and this busy summer season, to protect your home, you want to go pro with Ring Alarm Pro. To learn more, go to ring.com forward slash Clavin, ring.com forward slash Clavin. Ask anybody how to spell Clavin, and if they know the answer, set off the alarm. You know, so much of what we're seeing today, including these attacks on the Daily Wire and this attempt to shut Matt Walsh down uh, for his movie, uh, his terrific movie. I mean, it's just it is just a really good movie. I I have a I I have a um, basically the idea that I don't attack my friends if they make something that I don't like. I just won't say anything. My opinion uh, isn't that important that I have to express it. Uh, If I can say something nice, I will. But I won't lie. I'm not going to lie because I'm, I'm here to serve you guys. So even if it's a friend, I'm not going to go and tell you it's great. If it's not great, this movie is really, really terrific. Matt did a great job on it. It's an important movie. It makes a difference. It actually shows you what we're dealing with and why it's wrong. And Matt has answers for things, uh, the kinds of questions that the left is asking. I'm watching, I'm thinking, so much of what we're seeing today, this anti-freedom agenda. I mean, is there any freedom the left is for? They're not for free speech. They're not for right to bear arms. They're not really for uh, the states to have any rights whatsoever. Uh, all of it goes back to the failure of socialism, which not only failed in the Soviet Union catastrophically, and remember, they thought that was the future. They thought the Soviet Union was doing the right thing, uh, but it's fi- failed in Scandinavia. It has failed absolutely everywhere. And the success at the same time of free market capitalism and free minds, which not only, which elevates people, it elevates every level of person. I mean, nowadays, uh, even even the poor have many things that rich people used to not have. Uh, That's because of free markets, because of free minds. But it doesn't, that system, that free system does not allow elites to parade around pretending to themselves that they are sacred people who are higher and more moral than the rest of us. And that's what socialism allows them to do. Even if it makes you poor, it makes them feel really great about themselves. And so once their system failed, 
instead of just accepting it, it failed. You know what? The conservatives, these evil conservatives were right. We should stick with free markets. Instead of doing that, they just started to silence people. And this is how I got into political satire. About a, a le- this, These opens that I do, it really started about 11 years ago. Uh, a pal of mine, a, a fellow mystery writer, Roger Simon, started a place called PJTV. It uh, doesn't exist anymore, but it was one of the first th- kind of proto uh, sites like this one that did video stuff. And he said, you know, why don't you come over and make videos? And I said, I don't want to be in front of a camera. I'm a writer. I like hiding away in my room. Uh, but he said, well, at least watch what we're doing. And I watched and I saw Bill Whittle. And Bill Whittle was terrific and extraordinary uh, on-camera talent, but very serious. And I said, well, you know, it would be funny to do Bill Whittle as Mont- Monty Python. And Roger said, sure, go ahead. So I went in and made my first video, which is about the fact that they never, the left never makes arguments anymore. They just try to silence the arguments that disprove their beliefs because they haven't got any arguments because everything they believed in failed in the 1970s into the 1980s and the 1990s. It all collapsed and they just didn't accept the collapse. So they invented this entire world. I'll play you just a little clip of this first video. I want to warn you, I'm much younger here. So you might want to shield your eyes or put on sunglasses because my beauty uh, is dazzling. Let's cut 21. The left here has been making the shut up argument at least since the 70s, when it became clear that all their other arguments had failed. Since it was the only argument remaining to them, they had to invent different ways to say it. If you pointed out that their weakness allowed the murderous tyranny of communism to expand, for instance, well, you were a McCarthyite. Shut up. If you proved that their leniency toward criminals turned our cities into cesspools, you were a fascist. Shut up. When you pointed out that their welfare policies destroyed black families and created a social disaster of vast proportions, you were a racist, a sexist, uncivil, worse than Hitler. All just different ways of saying, shut up. So that became this this, uh, series, Clavin on the Culture, uh, directed by Justin Folk, who really collaborated with me to create a a beautiful, beautiful series, Look Great. And now Justin Folk directed Matt Walsh in What is a Woman? And he did a terrific job. And it exposes the destructive dishonesty of the transgender cult. And as I always have to say, I'm not attacking people who have gender dysphoria. I'm attacking this cult of people who want to convince us that this dysphoria uh, should be spread to the rest of the country, including children, so that these people feel better about themselves. So we premiere the film on the site, and we came under what is called a DDoS attack. I have to admit, I never heard of this before. It is a distributed denial of service attack coordinated, malicious campaign that seeks to shut down a targeted server by flooding the server with extreme levels of traffic from bots uh, and the high levels of traffic use up the server's resources. So we moved it into video on demand. Uh, Jeremy, the God King, says even so, the premiere had more viewers than any stream in the history of the site. It was a huge success for an amazing film that someone doesn't want you to see. And meanwhile, I mean, this is happening all over by transgender people. They are, it's all about shut up. It is all shut up. Their um, Amazon workers were celebrating Pride Month by going on strike and having a protest to get a bookseller to ban books, really good books, uh, like Abigail Schreier's book about the damage that is done to young people by the transgender cult. So it's not like they're arguing. They're not going to argue. They're just going to shut down the other argument because they have no argument. When I tweeted that, somebody said, well, isn't it an argument to say we're stopping hate? And it's no. Calling something hate is just another way of saying shut up. It's not an argument at all. And this shut up uppery permeates Matt's entire film, What is a Woman? It I I was watching it at backstage, or I'd actually watched it in in preparation for backstage, and I couldn't help, obviously language is my gig, right, and I couldn't help but notice that all the honest people in it, Jordan Peterson, Carl Truman, a psychiatrist who's uh, anti-transitioning children, as they say, this actual kind of soft language for butchering children and and castrating children and and cutting healthy young girls' breasts off, I mean, it's just an atrocity. Uh, The people who are telling the truth, Jordan and Carl, they speak very clearly. They say, this is what I think. These are the facts that support me. This is the argument that supports me. Whereas whenever, whenever uh, Matt challenges any of the trans cultists in the film, they immediately start using tricks and evasions. The most amazing one was he talks to this college professor and he's asking everybody, what is a woman? 
And they all use this kind of fake uh, therapeutic language. Why do you care? Why do you care? Which is like, you know, screw you. You, you put it all over the place. You made us care. You told us that we were uh, fired if we didn't use the right pronouns. Of course we care. And we care about the truth. And we care about our children. And we care about women who are really uh, getting the short end of this uh, by being erased, essentially, as a category. So he's talking to this professor. Uh, just listen to this. this. This is an amazing thing. He's talking to this professor about finding the truth. Cut one. Well, I mean, I think when someone tells you who they are, you should believe them. So if a person says that they're a woman or they're a man, then that's them telling you their gender is. I'm, I'm not so sure why, what social um, in interactions would have to do with, with maleness or femaleness that would well, be- I'm not even talking about social context. I'm just, I'm just trying to start by getting to the truth, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'm really uncomfortable with that language of like g getting to the truth again in social why, why life. Is that, why is that uncomfortable? Because that it sounds actually deeply transphobic to me. Um, and the if truth? you and, and if you keep probing, we're gonna stop the interview. I if I probe about what the truth is, you keep invoking the word truth, which is condescending and rude. I'm saying is, to you, how is the word truth condescending and rude? Why don't you tell me what your truth is, and you're walking on. 30 seconds more of the nights before I get up. <laughs> Just right. If you're not going to let me evade the question, I'm leaving right now. The truth, the truth is condescending and rude. The truth is transphobic. And yes, if you're, if you're a trans cultist, it is, in fact, uh, transphobic because we should all be afraid of this. But, uh, you know, I, I said this to Matt months ago, and I think I said it on the air, too. The reason this idea is so brilliant is because... It's all about words. He's asking for the definition of one of the most basic words in the language, in any language, in any society, everywhere, everywhere. Women and men have different roles. That is a human universal. They have different roles in every culture on earth forever, always. And so it's an important definition, and it's all about words. Here's how this works, all right? Here's how this entire thing works. There's a word gender. The word gender and sex for human beings were always synonymous. You could get a form in the old days and it would say gender and you'd write male or, or you know, uh, or female. And it was the same as, as what your sex was. They were synonymous words. So then the left says, well, we need another word to represent the traits that adhere to each sex because some, some women have masculine traits and, and hog the remotes and, and some men have feminine uh, traits and uh, lose sword fights, you know, <laughs> and that's true. We all know that's true. We've known that since history began. There are masculine women, there are feminine men. So they say, so we'll call those traits gender. And since gender is synonymous with sex, if you have feminine traits, you're a woman and should be operated on. But of course, gender stopped being synonymous with sex when you redefined it. They redefined it's a, it's a shell game. It's like they're moving the word around in different places. It's not no longer synonymous with sex. So if you have gender, feminine gender traits, you're not necessarily a woman unless you actually have to be, happen to be a woman. This is the whole thing I talk about all the time. This that without God, there is no truth. There's nothing for words to adhere to. This is why Hamlet, when he's pretending to be mad and and Polonius asks him, what are you reading? He says, I'm reading words, 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 because they're just objects on the page. They have absolutely nothing, no truth, nothing they're expressing to adhere to, right? Uh, they are have eliminated the inner world of human beings that, where we all recognize a tree, we all recognize a woman, we all recognize a man, and they've eliminated that and set the words free of truth. And then they say, well, it's just a question of who has the power to define the word. And you might say, well, why do you get the power? And they say, shut up. If you sleep, I don't know what that's like, but if you do sleep, sometimes hotter weather means you can't get a good night's sleep, so you want to get cozy earth. Cozy earth bedding is soft, luxurious, and it's temperature regulating. I actually have this problem. I get very hot at night, and since I'm awake, I experience the heat. So cozy earth is what you want. It's truly awesome betting. Thousands of customers agree with me. Here is a blurb from Tiffany who got it. She says, I bought these sheets in part for temperature regulation, which it does, but I didn't expect them to be so incredibly soft. It is like sleeping on a cloud. I immediately bought a second set for when it's time to change the sheets. Cozy earth sheets are made from the finest luxury materials, including soft viscose from highly sustainable and ethically produced bamboo. For a limited time, save 35% on cozy earth bedding. Check out their awesome loungewear too. Go to cozyearth.com and enter Claven at checkout to save 35% now. 
all backed by a 100-night trial. That's CozyEarth.com and enter Clavin at checkout for 35% off. I know what you're thinking. I want those, but I need to know how to spell Clavin. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no E's in Clavin. I just make it look this easy. So I'm reading a book called Desperate Remedies, really good book by a sociologist named Andrew Scull. He's from UC San Diego, and I've asked our producer, Lisa, to invite him on, but I can't believe he'll actually come because he's from UC San Diego. It's a history of psychiatry. It's a history of the way psychiatrists for more than a century have been treating the mentally ill. And it is, I mean, with all due respect for the horrific mind of Stephen King, he could not have imagined the atrocities that are committed. And they are all, every single one of them, and this is like, like goes right up to yesterday, they are all committed with the approval of the great and the good, with the New York Times cheering and the scientific community approving of it and false, uh, you know, um, statistics being passed around to support it. Uh, They're cutting out people's bowels because they say, well, infection is what caused madness. They're pulling their perfectly healthy teeth out of their head. And these people have no recourse. You know, they have no rights because they're in asylums and things like this. And all the time, each time, the papers and the media celebrates this great new advance in the treatment of mental illness. And the guy who's doing it becomes a hero. One guy actually won the Nobel Prize for inventing the lobotomy, a system that where a guy was traveling around like a traveling salesman with an ice pick. He wasn't even a surgeon, sticking it in people's eyes and mix, stirring around to cut their brains out. People going, this is great. This is a wonderful thing. Till finally someone would say, this isn't doing anything and it's killing people. And now we've got this trans thing. Now we've got this trans thing where they are telling children who don't even know, I mean, they're being bombarded with this garbage from this cult and from the society and their their virtue, you know, we've got corporations virtue signaling, firing people if they use the wrong pronoun, which happens to be the right program. They're mutilating girls, which I, I, you know, have chemically castrating boys. Here is Walsh talking to one of these well, in my opinion, a butcher has cut uh, two from what is a woman. What's the, what's the youngest patient that you've operated on? The youngest patient I've done vaginoplasty on um, is age 16. Do you worry that minors just don't understand enough about themselves? They're not neurologically developed enough yet to make permanent life-altering decisions? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Why would I worry that a minor doesn't know what, what sex he is, what, what gender he is? Because gender is, you know, it, it is an amazing thing. I've noticed this many, many times that a little lie becomes a bigger and bigger and bigger lie and a little intellectual dishonesty. It seems it's like going bankrupt. You know, Hemingway, I think it was, said you go bankrupt uh, very slowly and then very fast. A little intellectual dishonesty seems to be fine. You're just getting along. It's fine. You're not making sense. But why can't we all pretend that Leah Thomas is a woman? What's the problem? And then suddenly it's a disaster and you're butchering children. The New York Times, oh, it's great. And the scientific community goes, yes, absolutely. And it's been happening. It's been happening since this stuff began. I mean, that is what this book is about. It's about one atrocity after another. Because when you live, you know, and and the thing about it is too, is once you start to destroy a little bit of truth, you end up destroying all the truth. Because if you want to live in a fantasy, you want to live in a fantasy that you're a different sex, everyone has to agree. Otherwise, it's, it's the emperor's clothes. It is the emperor has no clothes. If one person says the emperor isn't wearing any clothes, then you can see that he's naked. When he's naked, you can see he has a penis because he's a man. But but the thing is, you know, The Emperor's Clothes was written by Hans Christian Andersen in the, uh, about two centuries ago. It was two, 200 years ago. But it was based on a story, uh, you know, it was based on a story in different cultures that went back almost a thousand years. So for a thousand years, essentially, they've been ta- telling, talking about The Emperor's New Clothes because it is something people do. They lie and they intimidate other people into lying. And they have to keep everybody silent or else the lie is exposed. It is the same exact thing that is happening now with gun control, the same pattern of bullying people. Anybody who says, if you don't sign on to gun control, you know, it's it's always a moral failing. It's not like I disagree with you because of this, this, and this, right? I, I, I support guns because of this. I don't support them to this. Here are my facts. Here are your facts. Let's compare. Let's bring them before the people. It's always a moral failing. Uh, here's, like, just as an example, right? Because here's Tim Miller. This is Bill Crystal's The Bulwark. They have a slogan, like the Times has all the news that's 
fit to print. Uh, Bill Crystal's The Bulwark is Please Make Me Relevant Again. Uh, Tim Miller talking about why Republicans don't support gun control. It's cut nine. If Republicans in Texas, if Greg Abbott and Ted Cruz and Republicans in D.C. don't pass red flag laws and raise the age to 21 to buy an assault rifle, the only reason they are not doing it is because of apathy about the deaths of those kids and, and cowardice. That's it. That's the only reason. We couldn't possibly, you know, James Madison wrote the, the Bill of Rights. It was apathy about these kids. He just doesn't care. You don't care. You don't care. We don't, we don't care. We're just hard-hearted people. You know, we see children being blown away. You know, it's like that. It's like a shooting gallery does. You know, I mean, that that way, it's shut up. That is shut up. That's shut up re- in in practice. You can see it going on right in front of you. Uh, that's shut up where you don't care. It's not like your argument is bad. Last Last week, I explained why I believe in gun rights why they're so important to the specifically American experience, which is this federation of states, because Madison knew that a large republic would fall, as the Roman Republic did when it became too big to be supported by a republic, but he knew that small republics linked together by a federal government might survive, because they would compete with each other, and that competition would keep good ideas alive. And that was why he let the states, when the states said, uh, you know, if the federal government has an army, how are we going to defend ourselves against them if they become oppressive. That's why you have gun rights. So that's the argument. You can disagree with it, but let's listen to some of these bad arguments. A CNN reporter named Manu Raju uh, reported this on Twitter. Um, he, he said that David Cicilline, who is a Democrat congressman, was arguing with Matt Gates during an a nine-hour House Judiciary Committee meeting on a guns package. They were debating over red flag laws. And David Cisline said, spare me the BS about constitutional rights. <laughs> so at least he said the quiet part out loud. At least we know where he's coming from. He says, you know who didn't have due process? You know who didn't have their constitutional right to life respected? The kids at Parkland and Sandy Hook and Ovalde and Buffalo. And the list goes on and on. So that argument... Let's think about that argument. It was a psychopath with a gun deprived these victims of their constitutional rights, and he sure did, and Cephas Cisline is right about that, so we should pay him back by stripping everyone else of their constitutional rights like a psychopath, right? Or as he calls it, the psych- he calls constitutional rights, he has a d- different name, he calls it BS, okay? So that's just not a good argument. It's just a purely emotional argument, but at least he made it. At least he came out and made it. Here is Ellie uh, Jerkface Mistel. He's a legal commentator uh, on MSNBC uh, who called the founders jerkfaces. Very mature guy, a uh, guy of deep wisdom and deep historical understanding. They're jerkfaces. They have funny hair and they wore those wigs and they wrote with feathers. How much of a jerkface can you be? So... <laughs> So he says, he points out that some of the uh, people who wanted to defend states' rights were also concerned about defending slavery. Let's cut three. I'm coming up with that just because I'm reading Patrick Henry and George Mason, who was then governor of Virginia at the founding of the country. This is not my words. This is what those white guys said when they were debating the Second Amendment. They said that they needed a Second Amendment because they needed the armed, disciplined, that was their word, militia to put down slave revolts. And they were worried that under the original constitution, the federal government had all of the power to raise the militia, right? The Southerners needed the militias to put down slavery votes because, you know, Mendy, it's a little bit difficult to hold people in bondage against their will. <laughs> so so the, thing about, the thing about this is that there's some truth to it. It's based on a book, and of course, it's, it's a distorted truth, but at least it's a half-truth that this urgently important doctrine of state rights, which Madison knew was important to keep a republic alive, to keep the republic small by keeping them in their states, that one of the reasons states' rights was so important to the South is they didn't want to lose their slaves. That's one of the reasons the states in the South wanted it. The important, urgent doctrine of state rights was stained when it was used to defend the sin of slavery, just like the federal government has been stained by the sin of abortion. So what do you do? You get rid of the sin, but you keep the state rights. You keep the important uh, right that you have. We need to have a federal government, too. We can't live without a federal government. That is a good thing to have, but when they do ill, when they do stuff like allow abortion or demand abortion or force abortion on the country, because abortion will still be, uh, just be up to the states if Roe v. Wade gets overturned. It's not going to be illegal. Most people think it's going to be illegal, but that's not true. Uh, You know, 
th- bad actions stain your argument, and that's what's what's happened. So he's got a case there, but it's kind of like saying, oh, there are child abusers in the church, uh, therefore there's no God. That's that's just not a, it's not a good argument, right? I mean, I, that's why we should try to behave well so we don't stain the things we represent. It's very important, but still the rights remain urgently important if you want to keep a republic alive. So here's some facts. Jason Riley, good writer uh, at the Manhattan Institute, also has columns in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, He says, a recent analysis of the Rand Corporation firearms database by the University of Oklahoma's Daniel Hamlin found significant increases and decreases in school gun incidents during periods when gun ownership rates remained relatively stable. In other words, and they keep pushing this by jiggering the uh, stats around, but it's not true. The number of guns has nothing to do with the number of school shootings. Gun violence, he goes on, that occurs away from school settings tells a similar story. Gun ownership rates in rural areas are higher than in urban urban areas, yet our cities tend to be more violent. I wonder who runs those cities. Uh, whites own firearms at much higher rates than blacks or Hispanics, yet gun violence among the latter two groups is much more commonplace. Moreover, proponents of additional gun laws ignore that shootings continue to plague places such as Chicago, which already has some of the country's most severe gun restrictions. How passing more gun regulations or taking guns away from the law abiding will deter criminals is a question they can't answer. So now our, our president, uh, the venal house plant, Joe Biden, says we are going to take away AR-15s and we're going to have all these other restrictions. Um, you could tell by when he said that a nine millimeter slug will blow the lungs out of your body that ultimately they want all the guns. But here's his speech that he made uh, where he basically boiled down what the argument really is. Just cut 30. At both places, we spent hours with hundreds of family members who were broken and whose lives will never be the same. They had one message for all of us. Do something. Just do something. For God's sake, do something. After Columbine, after Sandy Hook, after Charleston, after Orlando, after Las Vegas, after Parkland, nothing has been done. This time, that can't be true. This time, we we must actually do something. The issue we face is one of conscience, and common sense. <laughs> so, so Daniel Henninger uh, writes a column at the Wall Street Journal, and he wrote a whole column about do something. Uh, he says a big story before Evaldi was the baby formula shortage. This is still a big story. This is really a problem for moms. The result, in large part, of the risk averseness of the Food and Drug Administration. People wondered why the FDA so overcompensated on risk. The explanation lies in a long-ago impulse to do something. In the early 1960s, a drug for morning sickness called thalidomide caused the birth of of deformed babies, and laws were passed to tighten drug approvals. A mindset of hyper-precaution became embedded in the FDA's culture. The agency quickly erected a drug approval process of great complexity and cost, which often delayed the development of life-saving treatments. The high approval cost, now estimated at $2.6 billion, dollars per drug also means rarer diseases receive little research attention. That is the result of do something. That is the result of do something. You know, even if you don't believe in uh, Jesus, the story of the passion is one of the greatest stories about humankind ever told, the, the crucifixion and trial of Jesus. You know, this is about Jesus in that story. If you don't believe and, and if you do believe, is the truth. Jesus represents the truth. He says, I am the truth. I speak the truth. And those who know the truth speak my name. And the answer is the biggest shut up in, in human history, crucify him. And the people who say crucify him are everybody, the government, the religious people, the you know what is essentially the church. In, the, in this case, it was the synagogue, the people. Then the people are stirred up to call for crucifixion. Some people say, well, the government didn't because Pontius Pilate washed his hands of it. He said, well, I don't see anything wrong with him, but okay, go ahead and crucify him because I don't want to have a riot here. Think about that. Think about how you would react if somebody in the party you don't support, in this case, the Democrats, but if you're a Democrat, it could be a Republican. Just imagine for a minute him saying, yeah, um, I I don't have any problem with him, but go ahead and crucify him. Of course it's his fault. It's everybody's fault. They all do it. This is the way people behave. People do not love the truth. They hate the truth. It holds us to account. It makes us responsible to facts. It takes away, it strips us. It strips us of our sense of moral uh, 
of moral superiority. It strips us of our sense of, of being moral people and lets us see who we really are. We despise the truth. They crucified the Christ. But just remember the end of the story. And this is why we keep talking. This is why Matt Walsh makes his film, even though he knows he's going to get attacked and, and uh, slandered and have people scream names at him. This is why, you know, people write books, even though they know that Amazon workers are going to want them banned, because the, the people, the church, the government, Everybody will come after and kill and crucify the truth, but the truth never dies, and so it's always worth defending. So this is interesting. Insider Intelligence estimates that by the end of 2022, the number of U.S. adults who own at least one cryptocurrency will climb 19% to 33.7 million. Some surveys show that as many as 85% of millennial millionaires own crypto. Do you? Do you own any Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, or other cryptocurrency? If you don't and you're not sure where to start, check out Alto IRA. Alto offers alternative investment opportunities like private companies, crypto funds, real estate, venture capital, and more. Alto Crypto IRA, in particular, is a great way to start investing and trading in crypto with a tax-advantaged retirement account. Create an account in just a few minutes and invest with as little as 10 bucks, no setup charges. Through Alto's integration with Coinbase, you get secure trading 24-7, 150 plus available coins on their interface, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Cardano. Open an Alto Crypto IRA account with just as little as 10 bucks. Just go to altoira.com slash Andrew, that's A-L-T-O-I-R-A dot com slash Andrew. Start investing in cryptocurrency today. Go to altoira dot com slash Andrew. So I want to talk about Amber Heard and, and Johnny Depp, this, the verdict in their in Depp's uh, defamation suit. I have a, a different take on it than, than most people have, I think. But it comes back to lying. It all comes back to lying and the wages of lying. That, you know, lies, they don't go away. And if you don't correct your lies, if you don't speak the truth, the lie will have an effect. And that is really what happened in this trial. So the jury found in favor of Johnny Depp uh, that he was d defamed when Amber Heard uh, published a, under her name, an op-ed in the Washington Post that had really been written by the ACLU saying that she was a representative of an abused woman, implying that Depp had abused her. Depp said it destroyed his career. The jury awarded him uh, $15 million, but the, because of the rules of the state, Virginia, uh, they had to cut it back to about $10 million. So now, uh, luckily, Johnny Depp is uh, a wealthy movie star, so he won't have any personal problems. <laughs> and, and Amber Heard also won uh, $2 million because uh, Depp's lawyer said that her claims were a hoax. I have to, I have to say, <laughs> this, this trial ruined, <laughs> it ruined Aquaman for me. I mean, just that thing where Amber Heard pooped in his bed, you know, this is like, I was thinking about Aquaman. I like, this is why I don't go swimming in public places. But, but, you know, I watched that movie. All I could remember of that movie, so help me, was Amber Heard's cleavage, and now she's ruined even that. All right. But, but here's the thing. They were getting their usual right-left thing. So if the right says one thing, the left says the other, and the left says one thing, the right says the other, the left says, this is the death of Me Too, the all-important Me Too movement. And the right says, well, he's now saying Johnny Depp acted heroically, that even though he was a drug addict, and even though he said horrifying, awful things about his wife, at least he stepped forward to defend himself for all mankind, and he didn't beat his wife, and now he's, he's cleared his name. I'm not making a hero out of either of these people. These people have everything. They had everything, and they acted like garbage, and they treated each other like garbage. They had everything in the world that a person could have. They had success and money uh, and people adoring them, and, you know, they basically were living this great life, and they just— they, they just had behaved abominably, and I'm sorry, but this is not like a great victory for humankind that Johnny Depp gets $10 million, which he probably doesn't have at this point. The fact is, I watched, you know, I sampled a lot of the testimony, and he he did abuse her. I mean, yeah, it was mutual abuse. I mean, even they, they brought on their marriage counselor, Depp brought her on, and she said they, they were mutually abusive. They beat each other up. And so... Christine Hoff Summers writes about this in her book, uh, Who Stole Feminism, that a lot of abuse cases are 
women hitting men and men hitting them back. And that doesn't turn out so good for the woman. So the woman starts a fight and starts throwing her hands around and the guy clocks her and she's the one who gets really hurt. So if the left wants to say, well, it's not fair because he's so much bigger and stronger when he hits her, it's much worse, then my answer to that is, okay, that's why Leah Thomas shouldn't swim in girls' sports. Once you start telling a lie, remember, everything has to fit together. Your philosophy has to make sense because the world makes sense. So once you start telling a lie, that lie comes back. If you're going to say that Leah Thomas can swim with the, with the girls, then Johnny Depp can punch with Amber Heard, right? When you lie, the lie follows you home. I mean, that's, that's the, the thing. I used to know a private detective. She was a lovely, lovely lady who helped me with my Weiss Bishop novels, the trilogy of detective stories. And one of the things she did was defense attorneys would hire her, and if you witnessed a murder, she would go out and find somewhere where you would lie, probably on your resume, because almost everybody, you know, kind of puffs up their resume. And then when you were in court and you said, well, I was standing there and I saw this guy shoot somebody, the defense attorney says, did you lie on your resume? And you go, well, yeah. Well, how do we know you're not lying now? And that always works with jurors, because if you lie about one thing, you're likely to lie about other things. You lie about a small thing, you're likely to lie about a big thing. A lie follows you home. And that is exactly what happened to Amber Heard. She might have made the case that there was some mutual abuse going on, but she was so dishonest. She lied and lied and lied. There was this one thing, I found this painful to watch. I found it actually embarrassing. She claimed she was going to donate the $7 million divorce settlement she got from Depp. She said she was going to uh, donate half of it to the ACLU and half of it to a children's charity. And now Depp's lawyer goes after her. This is uh, a long cut, but it's worth listening to. Uh, Cut 12. Sitting here today, Ms. Heard, you still haven't donated the $7 million divorce settlement to charity. Isn't that right? Incorrect. I pledged the entirety no, of Ms. the Heard, settlement, $7 that, million, to question. charity, and I, f- I Heard, intend to Ms. fulfill Heard, those obligations. Ms. Heard, that's not my question. Please, what try to question? answer my question. Sitting here today, you have not donated the $7 million, donated, not pledged, donated the $7 million divorce settlement to charity. I use pledge and donation synonymous with one another. They but the I same don't. Thing. Ms. Heard, I don't use it synonymously. That's how donations are paid. Ms. Heard, respectfully, that's not my question. As of today, you have not paid $3.5 million of your own money to the ACLU. Yes or no? I have not yet. And as of today, you have not paid $3.5 million of your own money to the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, correct? I have not yet. Johnny sued me. So that's, that's what destroys her. That's what destroyed her. She lies about one thing. The jury's thinking, well, then she's lied about everything. She's a liar. And she, and she did. I mean, she did it again and again. I just picked that one because I found it so pain, so painful to watch. I mean, I, I use pledge and uh, donate synonymously. I said, hey, Danny, I'm pledging a million bucks. I'm going to give you a million bucks after the show. Uh, <laughs> well, I pledged it, so it's, it's done. So here's Heard's reaction when she loses the case. It's cut 18. She said, this is a big setback, and it's a big setback for, uh, for women. It sets back the clock to a time when a woman who spoke up and spoke out could be publicly shamed and humiliated. It sets back the idea that violence against women uh, is to be taken seriously. And this, of course, is what the left is saying. Our friend Michelle Goldberg on Knucklehead Row, the opinion uh, section of the New York Times, a former newspaper, uh, she writes, the explosion of defiant, desperate feminist energy that was Me Too has now been smothered by an even fiercer reaction. Me Too is a movement of women telling their stories. Now that Heard has been destroyed for identifying as a survivor, other women will think twice. Okay, okay. So let's talk about Me Too, all right? Because this is, all I'm saying is you lie about little things, you lie about big things, and it destroys your credibility. Remember Brett Kavanaugh, our Supreme Court Justice? Remember Christine Blasey Ford stood up and told this story about something that had happened in high school between them. As Molly Hemingway pointed out on her book on the subject that she wrote with uh, Carrie Severino, there was zero evidence that Ford and Kavanaugh had ever met. Zero evidence that Ford and Kavanaugh had ever met. Now, 
I'm sure you all remember the reaction. Every single day in the news, every single day, this story. And yes, she was very credible. She sounded, she sounded, she looks credible. She not just sounded credible, she looked credible. And women were writing op-eds that said essentially, I was attacked, so I believe Christine Ford. This is this guy's life and career. It's Brett Kavanaugh's life and career. There's no proof these two ever met. No proof at all they ever met. And they did everything they could to derail uh, the, the nomination of this justice because they didn't like him. They didn't like his politics. So here is Jeff Flake. He's a senator. He's considering his vote. He is accosted in an elevator by two activists screaming about the fact that here this horrible man, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, because he's been accused without any kind of proof at all that he, he can't vote for him. Here's the clip. I have two children. I cannot imagine that if for the next 50 years, they will have to have someone in the Supreme Court who has been accused of violating a young girl. What are you doing, sir? I was this sexually is assaulted and nobody country. believed me. I didn't tell anyone, and you're telling all women that they don't matter, that they should just stay quiet because if they tell you what happened to them, you're going to ignore them. That's what happened to me, and that's what you're telling all women in America, that they don't matter. They should just keep it to themselves because if they have told the truth, you're just going to help that man to power anyway. So, again, the same stuff we see with the transgender people, the same thing we see with the gun people. It's the tears. It's the emotion. It is the fact that you are a bad person for doing what you're doing. But there's no, there's no argument there because there's no evidence whatsoever that this woman is telling the truth. Anybody can say anything about anybody, right? You know, as, they, as the lawyers like to say, you can indict a ham sandwich because all you're doing is accusing uh, somebody of something. All right. So... But we all know that women do get abused. They do get hurt. They do get mistreated. We all know this is true, and it all offends it offends any, any man who's a man is offended by this. But then Joe Biden is quite plausibly accused by a, 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 a woman who is his aide in the Senate, Tara Reid. She says he threw her against a wall, and he forcibly shoved his finger up her, okay? And here are the feminists reacting to that. This is cut 11. That was actual video of feminists reacting to the charge that Joe Biden essentially uh, assaulted, sexually assaulted an aide. The New York Times, which ran op-ed after op-ed after op-ed about Christine Blasey Ford, did not say a word for, I believe it was 20 days. It may have been 21 days. And then on Easter Sunday, when nobody's reading the newspaper— they buried it in that, you know, that enormous Sunday Times. They buried it on page, I don't even know what page it was. It was page like 112B or something like this. They bury the story saying, eh, we don't believe it. We don't believe it. We checked it out. Take our word for it. We don't believe it. Dean Bacay, the then editor of the New York Times, did an interview. Was, was he operating on a double standard? And he says, well, we didn't, you know, it wasn't being covered, so we didn't cover it. So it wasn't an important story. It wasn't being... In other words, we, it wasn't in the New York Times, so the New York Times didn't cover it. That was his argument. And his argument was also, well, Brett Kavanaugh was running for, you know, was up for a very important spot, the Supreme Court. <laughs> Joe Biden was running for president. He was running for president of the United States. He lied. It was an open lie. It was an obvious lie. It was the kind of lie that corrupt politicians tell, you know, yeah, I put the money in a little black box, you know. He, he, they didn't cover it because they were protecting Joe Biden. You lie in a little, you lie in a lot. So once we know, once we know that the, um, that the Me Too movement is being used for political purposes, all those women are being effectively silenced, not by us, because I, I feel that the women had a point. I worked in Hollywood. I know they were being chased around the desk. I know, you know, there's a monument. This is no kidding. In a mall in Hollywood, a gigantic, uh, several-story tall mall, there's a monument to the casting couch. It's a big joke. If you want to get a job in Hollywood, you got to lie down on the casting couch and, and give the producer some sex. Well, that's still going on, and everybody knows it's going on. So I, I have sympathy for the Me Too movement, but once you use it for politics, it's all a lie. Once you tell a little lie, it's like Amber Heard, Me Too had, just like Amber Heard, Me Too had some truths to tell. 
But when you lie, the lie follows you home. And that is what's happening with the transgender movement. It's what's going to happen with the guns. That's why the Republicans should stay away from it. It happens to all of us. It happens to all of us. It's a good reason to tell the truth. So if you're sitting in your car and it's not moving because it's broken and you're saying, why can't I get a date? It's because women look at you and they say, first of all, you're not smart enough to fix your car. And second of all, you don't say rockauto.com. They love that sound. It's like a dog whistle with women. It sounds so cool. And it lets them know that you know how to get your car moving using just your computer and the terrific rockauto.com catalog. Go to rockauto.com to shop for auto and body parts from hundreds of manufacturers. Their prices are always the same for everybody, and they're low. It's, and the catalog is really good. It is really easy to use. You can see all the parts available for your vehicle. Choose the brands, specifications, and prices you prefer. And best of all, you get to say, hey, honey, I'm going... <laughs> I'm going over to rockauto.com. I'm telling you, it will change your love life. Go to And also your car will work so you can go on a date. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck and write Clavin. But you got to do it the same way. You got to bring that same energy. Say Clavin in the how did you hear about us box so they know I sent you and they know that you can say rockauto.com. So I want to talk about comedy because comedians have become one of the bulwarks against woke culture, especially trans culture, because it makes no sense, so it's good for comedy. Uh, and and the brave ones are doing it, and they're under attack, and they're under attack from their fellow showbiz people, uh, the woke people. Uh, Ellen Page, who's now Elliot Page, uh, you, you know, basically says, these jokes have an impact that hurt people. Uh, I understand that people might think it doesn't. I understand that they're not meaning to, but it's not a joke. It's not a joke. You believe what you're saying. You believe it. It's not a joke. Uh, and so there's people just basically saying these comedians should do woke comedy and they should stop, you know, uh, pointing to the ludicrousness of some of the things they believe. And, and, you know, one of the things that really bothers me about the trans cult is, I, like most people, I want to be nice to people. I don't want to insult people. I don't want to insult Elliot Page, you know, if I if, if she wants to be called uh, Elliot, if, if she wants to be called he, you know, I, it, it's nothing to me. But they make it so that by doing that, I am biting into the apple of the lie. And I, that's what I don't want to do. So they make it impossible even to be polite because it's our politeness they're using against us. So Norm MacDonald has this final special. I'll be talking about Gervais and a couple other comedians. But Norm MacDonald has this final special. He died uh, last year, I think it was. But before he went in for an operation in 2020, he said he didn't want to leave anything in case this operation went south. And so he just did it from his home. Uh, and here's one of the things he says. It's cut 25. And you're a comedian. They expect you to know things nowadays. You know what I mean? It didn't used to be like that. Like during the Vietnam War, they wouldn't go... Wonder what Red Skeleton thinks on this. But nowadays, like I've heard, they go, the a comedian is the modern day philosopher, you know? Which, uh, first of all, it always makes me feel sad for the actual modern day philosophers <laughs> who exist, you know? Um, they're, they're, they're working, trying to come up with their philosophy, you know? And they go, God damn, you ever hear of this uh, nightclub comic? He's got, he's doing some very good work on uh, totalism or what the hell, <laughs> what the hell you say? <laughs> so, so that is funny because comedians are not philosophers. And so because they are the ones who have the courage to stand up to the, to the woke people, uh, we are looking to them to know more than they know. They're there to be funny. They're there to be, you know, to be observational, to point out things that don't make sense in human interchange, that don't make sense in the news, the corruption, the folly, the lies of human life. That's what co comedy is made out, out of. But sometimes I think we give them a little too much credit. The HBO is doing a uh, two-part George Carlin special. And like everybody, I love George Carlin. He can be really funny. This is by, it's directed by Judd Apatow and, and Michael Bonfiglio. Uh, and, and Apatow said, I think one of the reasons why we wanted to make this documentary was because uh, Carlin kept trending on Twitter and has for a really long time. Whenever anything happens in the news, people start putting clips up on the internet, and it's really shocking how many subjects he has the best routine about and the best insight about. Now, Carlin's most famous routine one of the most famous comedy routines ever, I think, is the it's the seven words you can't say on TV. And this routine has always fascinated me because it is funny. Uh, it is, it's kind of important. He's saying something important. But it's also 
completely wrong. It is completely, it, its point is completely untrue. And uh, I've had this argument with, a lot because people love Carlin and they love the routine. So people always say, no, no, it's really true. But it's not. Here's just a, we can't play it because he says the seven words over and over that you can't say on TV and we don't use those words. But here's just a little bit of the setup. This is cut 24. There are just some words, not many either, just a few, that we've decided, well, we won't use them all the time. Sometimes, well, hell yeah. Sometimes it's okay, but not all the time. That's, and they're the only words that seem to have that restriction. I mean, there are a lot of words you can say whenever you want, you know? Pneumonia! Nobody gives you a lot of... All right, you can't yell it in the hospital a great deal, but what the hell? There are words that you can say, no problem. Topography! No one has ever gone to jail for screaming topography. But there are some words that you can go to jail for. There are some words that we just have decided we will not say all the time. Sometimes, okay, if you're running through the jungle chasing somebody that we're at war with, you can holler them. If you're shooting a criminal, it's okay, it's the all-American thing. Dirty f <laughs> But if you're with the bishop's wife at lunch, it's better not to ask for the damn lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny because people are, are funny and people don't entirely make sense. He was arrested for this uh, in 1972 in Wisconsin. Now, the court case was uh, dismissed. And the judge ruled that while Carlin's language was definitely indecent, uh, he had the freedom to say it as long as he caused no disturbance, uh, which I agree with. Uh, but the routine is funny because it points out this strange, seemingly random thing that people do by b banning some words or saying some words can't be said in certain places. We don't ban top topography, but we do ban curses. And they're just words, words, words. And uh, that's transgressive. But it's actually only true on the surface because he's not a philosopher. He's a comedian. He's finding something funny about the way we live. The word topography describes a thing, but it describes it in a certain way, what we would call maybe a scientific way or a technical way. And an obscenity can describe something in another way. If I use the words, the dawn of autumn, that says something different than September 22nd, which is the dawn of autumn, it's the start of autumn, right? But those are two different things. And because we have an inner life and because our inner lives are related to one another, our inner lives are not, each person does not have an independent truth. We have an inner, inner life that are all circled around and in collaboration with the truth. We can communicate and we can communicate an idea. When I say to you, the dawn of autumn, something different comes into your head and it's pretty similar to what comes into my head than when I say September 22nd, which is you know, not, not the same thing, but is the same thing. So if I use the words make love or have sex, those say two different things. And if I use the F word, that says something else. And because we're all human beings, we all have an inner life, and because our inner lives are interacting uh, with reality, those communicate feelings to something. And if I say F you, I'm communicating something. And if I say, oh, I f her, you know, that's different than, you know, I was making love to her. And and there is a reason that we keep those things away from children. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm not a, in favor of any kind of censorship, but I think we can keep certain things in a private place and keep them away from children, keep them away from uh, general, general use, because I think it's degrading. I think it degrades our conversation. And I think it has, as we see when we listen to people, it has degraded our kind of our conversation. Now, why am I picking on poor George Carlin? He's not here to defend himself. But that way of thinking that there is no inner life, that we're just these kind of meat puppets, that feeds into something else. This is the way the special, this uh, George Carlin is American Dream, I think it's called. Uh, this is the way it begins. This is the first thing that happens in the special, Cut 29. Here's another civic superstition I have a problem with. Rights. Boy, everybody in this country's always running around yammering about their rights. I have a right. You have no right. We have a right. They don't have a right. The government has a right. Yeah, 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 fine. Listen, folks, I hate to spoil your fun, but there's no such thing as rights, okay? We made them up. They're imaginary, like the boogeyman, the three little pigs, Pinocchio, stuff like that. It's fictional. Fictional idea, rights. People say, well, they come from God. They're God-given rights. Oh, f here we go again. The God excuse, the last refuge of a man with no answers and no argument, it came from God. But let's say it's true. Let's say it's true that God gave us these rights. Fine. Why would he give us a certain number of rights? The Bill of Rights in this country has 10 stipulations, 10 rights. And by the way, God must have been doing sloppy work because you've had to amend the Bill of Rights an additional 17 times. God left out a few things like slavery. Just overlooked it that day. 
<laughs> so, of course, there's a difference between, there's a bad argument because there's the difference between human actions and God's actions. But the argument that we have no rights, which is becoming a very popular argument, Yuval Harari makes this, that it's all just a fiction that we made up. It has no relation. And, and you know, as I always say, fiction is a way of telling the truth, right? But, but not for Yuval Harari because he doesn't believe in the inner life of human beings. And neither does George Carlin. And the seven words you can't use on TV and the fact that you have no rights are related because if we don't believe in what I call the great speculation that your inner life is as important to you as mine is to me and both are important to God, if we don't believe in that, then we can't communicate with one another because when I say the dawn of autumn, I can't f figure I'm giving you a poetic idea that's coming out of my head about the start of a season. But I can count on that. I can count on that with most people. And so it is true with words. And so I can also say that that inner life, which doesn't want to be oppressed, has the right not to be oppressed. It has the right to develop in its own way because you have a, it, I mean, it's a long argument, but you have a, you develop through virtue. Virtue has to be freely chosen. No one has the right to take your freedom away. So I'm watching also Ricky Gervais, and I, I had this kind of tweet that went, I, I don't know if viral is the right word, but it certainly was popular and was gotten a lot of reaction. And Ricky Gervais goes on about transgender people, so everybody on the right is very happy about him, and here's what he says, a part of his joke about uh, transgenderism, 27. Oh, women. Uh, <laughs> not all women. I, I mean the old-fashioned ones. You know, the old-fashioned women. Oh, God. You know, the ones with wombs. Oh. <laughs> Those f dinosaurs. Uh. No, I love the, the new women. I know the new women. They're great, aren't they? The, you know the new ones we've been seeing lately? The, the ones with beards and <laughs> They're as good as... They're as good as gold. I love them. No, it's the old-fashioned. And now the old-fashioned... They're like, oh, they want to use our toilets. Why shouldn't they use your toilets? For ladies. They are ladies. Look at their pronouns. <laughs> What about this person that isn't a lady? Well, his penis. <laughs> Her penis, you f bigot. <laughs> what if he rapes me? What if she rapes you? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because he's hitting on the same thing that Matt Walsh is hitting on. And what is a woman that it's all about words is, is a construct entirely made of words and it can be disassembled by words. Now, he, you know, he goes on later on. He has a very long joke about uh, becoming trans, uh, becoming a trans woman. And it's not funny. It's just it's second rate material. And he keeps giggling about how it's second rate material throughout, which I don't think is a very high comedy. I think it's actually a, a very smart guy who does very good comedy, doing poor comedy. I didn't think the special was all that great. Best joke in it is an old, old joke about a China, Chinese guy named Ling. W wait for that one. That knocked me out of my chair because he just, he, the way he spr springs it on you is just great. Uh, but now he says something, he's always parading his atheism, which is kind of funny because he says he's a terrible worrier and he's out of weight and he, overweight and he drinks too, too much. Maybe he should believe in God, but he doesn't believe in God. And so this is what he says about this, this is cut 26. People quiz me on Twitter when they find out I'm an atheist. They go, what, what you don't believe in God at all? I go, no. Do, do you pray? I go, no. They <laughs> go, why don't you pray just in case there's a God? And I say... Why do you put garlic over your door just in case there's a Dracula, right? Uh, and I've got no problem with praying, you know? I know loads of nice Christians and Muslims and Jews, and if one of my family is very ill, they always say, oh, I'll pray for them. And I always say, oh, thanks very much, because it's a nice gesture. If they said, oh, we also cancelled the chemotherapy, I go, don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> pray, or fill your boots, son, but let's... <laughs> let's do the praying and the chemotherapy, shall we? Because that's the same result as just the chemotherapy. So let's, <laughs> let's definitely keep that one, shall we? <laughs> Very funny. Now, I, I thought that was, that was a really good joke. Uh, and I tweeted and I said, how come I laughed at his anti-God joke, but the trans people thought his anti-trans jokes were offensive? And I said, my theory is, I, I think it's because I actually believe in God. <laughs> and in other words, that they know that they've constructed this house of cards made out of words. And when a comedian, that's the tool that a comedian uses, when a comedian points out that the words simply don't make sense, aren't making sense, the whole house of cards collapses. Not quite the same when you're talking about God. Now, I, some of the people on Twitter who attacked me for this, of course, the left did, but some of the people were believers because they thought it was impious, unpious of me to 
laugh at a, a joke about God. And that is true. I am impious. I am not a, a pious person. I dislike piety. Uh, I dislike parading how pious you are. I think it is, uh, first of all, it's incredibly uh, unattractive. I, you, can't, you cannot make a comment about God without seriously, it is seriously someone trying to out-pious you. It's just amazing. Like you say, God is beautiful. So, well, beautiful, that's a human construct. If you look at the book of Melchior, you know, verse 150, so, you, know, you just make up books of the Bible. You know, somebody is always going to tell you that he's more pious than you are. Uh, and my feeling is, eh, good for you. <laughs> I'm glad. My, my favorite was a guy on Twitter. I have to, this is an aside, but I have to say this. One guy on Twitter said, Clavin's just a Christian to sell books. <laughs> I just wrote that. First of all, I, you know, could you send me my money back from being blacklisted in, in Hollywood? But also, I, I just wrote this book, The Truth and Beauty, knowing that God wanted me to write it and that it was not going to sell, that nobody was going to buy it. And I put it out myself because I thought it was worthwhile and all this stuff. And it ends up, uh, you know, b b only by God's work, it ends up a best, and yours, and your work for buying it. it it ends up a bestseller. And then the guy says, yeah, Clay is just a Christian. Because he, anyway, I thought it was funny. The thing about the God joke is funny because it's true. It is true. Prayer has a power. But of course, we also need to deal with material in a material way. And this is actually in The Truth and Beauty. I talk about the fact that monks used to feel that lightning came from demons. So they would climb up in the steeple and <laughs> ring the bells to chase the demons away. And the demons would hit them because they were up high on a steeple with a metal bell and the monks would be <laughs> killed, right? Because a religion passes through time, like everything else, it passes through time. Everything else human it passes through time and it collects the superstitions of its time and those superstitions become interwoven with the beliefs and then it seems when they disprove the superstitions, they've disproved the belief, which isn't true whatsoever, right? But it, the disparity remains funny. It remain, I, I mean, obviously it's tragic, but it's a long time ago. But it's, it's funny that these monks are doing exactly the wrong thing to chase off the demons, ringing the bell. And that's the, the reason it's funny. It doesn't dispel God. It's, God is not mocked. Human beings are mocked. And we are funny. We're corrupt and we're, uh, you know, uh, illogical. And we do terrible things that when we should do beautiful things. And we were made to be like unto the angels, and instead we're these naked apes. You know, we've fallen, we're fallen people. And all of that is funny. And so when George Carlin or uh, Norm MacDonald or Ricky Gervais point out the absurdity of the world, if you're offended, it may be because you're absurd, okay? That's, that's why. If it's funny, it's because it says something true, almost always, I think all, always really. But when George Carlin you know, tells me I have no rights, or when Ricky Gervais says there's no God, it, it's to laugh. So this is the part of the show we call the member break, where we talk to members and try to get people to become members to help us in what we're doing here. Uh, you know, obviously we're a capitalist uh, organization. We want to make money, but we use that money to do the th kinds of things you want to see done. And now we've got this film, What is a Woman? I, I just think it is just an incredible piece of content. And I really uh, congratulate Matt on doing it. it and, and Justin, uh, my pal Justin, it, it's just good. It is good material. And it's, you know, here's here are some blurbs for it. Uh, Ali Beth Stuckey, uh, the host of Relatable, said it's compelling, funny, terrifying, but hopeful. Megan Kelly said this film has a very serious message and one you're going to want to hear. Uh, and uh, Zuby, the rapper, uh, had a great line. He says, uh, it's simultaneously interesting, amusing, and absolutely terrifying. It is all true. This is all true. And like I said, I, you know, I will uh, try to say nice things about my pals and my colleagues, uh, but I won't lie for them. So I am telling you the truth. You are going to want to watch this and you're going to want to subscribe. You want to you go to whatisawoman.com, right? And you will get 25% off the subscription rate. Uh, whatisawoman.com, you get 25% off. And then you can watch the film here. And the reason we give it to, to members is because we need your support to do what we do. If you're paying Netflix for their content. You're paying people who hate you to make stuff that insults you. Here, you're paying people who actually love you, who want to make the stuff that our culture needs. Matt Walsh has done a major, major work here. Uh, it's, it's good for him. Congratulate him. Justin Folk, I want to congratulate him too. And I want you to congratulate him by going on whatisawoman.com and getting 25% off your subscription to The Daily Wire.
So since we're talking a lot about uh, truth, I think it is a wonderful time to bring on Eric Metaxas. I always like talking to Eric. Uh, he is a, a terrific writer uh, and even a decent human being as well, which not many writers are. Uh, he's a number one New York Times bestseller. Uh, he's got a new back book out called Is Atheism Dead? Uh, he's written some wonder. He wrote a, a biography of Bonhoeffer. It's just terrific. One of Martin Luther. I, I believe he was a writer on Veggie Tales, if I'm not mistaken, which was a, a ter- still a terrific show. And he has got a national syndicated show called the Eric Metaxas Radio Show. Eric, it is great to see you. It's great to see you too. Thank you. Uh, is atheism dead? Let's talk about that further. There are a lot of things I actually want to talk to you about, but is atheism dead? Uh, you explain where the title comes from, first of all. Well, yeah, it's important to explain the title. Um, obviously, some people remember 1966, a very famous Time magazine cover article asked the question, is God dead? You know, picking up on Nietzsche, God is dead. And the reason I wrote this book and titled it, Is Atheism Dead?, is this is very ironic and it's hard for people to process because we live in such a secular culture that the evidence for God, which has become ridiculous, <laughs> overwhelming evidence from science, it's pretty much buried or ignored. And when you look at it, as I did, I have over the years, but it kind of got to a point where I said, this is preposterous. The evidence is open and shut. It's not even well, there's a lot of evidence. I mean, it's like saying, well, there's a lot of evidence that the earth is not flat. Trust me, it's not flat. <laughs> no. We don't really need to weigh the evidence at this point. There's enough evidence that we can actually decide. That's how I felt. And I said, I know most people won't believe it when you say it, but when they read the book, they'll get it. They'll see that it has become ridiculous. And I said, the only question to ask today is, is atheism dead? And of course, people say, well, it's not dead. I'm an atheist. And so, well, you could be a flat earther. If you look at the facts, atheism is no longer tenable. Agnosticism, questions, great. But actual atheism, it strikes me as genuinely untenable at this point. And I wanted to put out this information to to show people uh, that's not bluster. Read it and you too. Tell me what you think. You know, I, I'm a, I completely agree with you about this, and I, I really do think that it, it made some sense after Newton for people to extrapolate and sort of say, well, I guess everything's going to turn out to be kind of a big machine, but Newton was wrong. Right. I mean, he, he only got this little picture of things, and it's really out of date. It's an out of date uh, philosophy. So you mentioned, let, before we get into some of the, the meat of this, you mentioned that it, people still don't believe. So when you're saying, is atheism dead? Do you feel that there is a movement back to belief? Because we've gone through a long period of decline in church attendance and people saying that they're, they have a religion and all that. Do you feel that that is shifting at all? I don't think it could help but shift. Uh-huh. I, I think it is shifting for many reasons. But I think, listen, just because somebody doesn't like something doesn't mean that eventually they're going to have to deal with it. You know, whether you're talking about a stolen election or you're talking about vaccines or whatever controversial thing you want to talk about, Ultimately, the information will come out and people will have to deal with it. I mean, in the book, I write about, for example, Galileo. Um, And I talk about Galileo, the story of Galileo as being kind of the founding myth of secularism and atheism. And it's it's really ridiculous. But without going into that, the reason I bring up Galileo is that he said to people, hey, listen, uh, don't take my word for it. Look through the telescope yourself. You tell me what you think. And and people can hate where the evidence points. They can hate what you're saying. But over time, eventually, the truth will out, to quote Shakespeare. There is no way around it. And I really think that there are conversations being had now, tomorrow, yesterday, uh, in back rooms, scientists talking to other scientists saying that, you know what, this paradigm, it's not working. I, I don't know who's going to have the guts to raise his hand and say, uh, you know, this this doesn't work, whether it's blind Darwinism or whatever it is. There's a lot of that going on. And again, the irony is that the more we know from science, the more uh, it becomes impossible to hold on to this materialist thesis. So, so people are kicking against the goads. And I think the evidence, when you talk to folks like Stephen Meyer and others I quote in my book, they know when they go to these conferences that 
people who really know what's going on, they see the handwritings on the wall. The only question really is, how are they going to process it? Right, right. I mean, you talk. You know, when you talk about, it, I mean, Stephen Meyer was on the show. Really, he he wrote a good book too. But the, but you include a lot of that information here. The the scientific, you know, backwash that basically is washing away the logic of this. I remember standing with you in a in a circle of people at one of these conferences, and somebody kind of going on with being very literal about the Bible, and you turned to him and said, "I, I don't really care how God made the world. I just know he, he made it." And, and so it is, it is. Science is a beautiful thing, and it does reveal yeah. all this stuff, but. I've never heard a single thing that has made me doubt the truth of the essential Bible. Is that is that pretty much where you stand? Or you, yeah. Well, I, again, I find it funny because the narrative which we've all been, you know, force fed the propaganda narrative. Whether you want to start with Galileo or you want to go to Darwin or whatever it is that the God of the gaps. The more we learn from science, the more it pushes God out. Well, that thesis worked for about 20 minutes and then everything shifted. And then the more information that comes in, it's the opposite. But we got stuck on that narrative. Um, so the first part of the book is about science. The middle part of the book is about biblical archaeology. It, it's, it's equally preposterous. Every time you turn over a stone in the Middle East, you find more evidence for the Bible as history. And when you get people, you know, whether it's, I, I, I forget which Attenborough it is, talking about, well, the the Bible, it's a creation myth, and there's all these other creation myths. There is no other plausible creation myth. In other words, if you want to just talk about creation myths, for example, how is it possible that the Bible, uh, that, the, that the first chapters of Genesis, ostensibly written 15 centuries uh, before Christ, they get the order of creation right? In other words, just that alone should make you say, wait a minute. That's insane. How does somebody from like the Mycenaean era, from 15 centuries BC, how did they get this order correct? Because all the other, uh, all the other creation myths talk about crazy stuff like you know a, a snake swimming in milk and exploding into a thousand stars, and you know that that's the level of the other creation myths. This one, albeit poetic, it it talks about scientific scientific things and the the more time passes the more it becomes clear that the bible is history that those who want to dismiss it as folk tales they're just being intellectually sloppy they're just not reading it or they're not dealing with it seriously and i think it's just gotten so overwhelming i said i've got to put the basics in a book and of course on the, the there are a few things that have come out recently but james tour who's a nano uh scientist in at rice university in houston he gave me some information. I thought, I've never heard about this. That's crazy. Then I met a guy uh, in Albuquerque who uh, discovered biblical Sodom, an archaeologist. And I thought, this information should be on the, the cover of every uh, you know, major paper. It's not getting out there. And I, I need to get this information out there. So there's just lots of stuff in it. Uh, and I, and I, I think it's really compelling. And I think if you're honest, if you want to know what's going on, you know, you, you're going to find out that uh, a, a lot of a lot of these narratives that we're dealing with for decades and decades, they're obsolete. We've got to be honest with the facts. Can you talk a little bit more about the archaeology? Because I, I was talking to an archaeologist who told me that, there, that he just didn't believe in um, the exodus. He didn't believe that the Jews, you know, escaped or that there right. was slavery. And, and, right. and if you read Exodus, it's so clearly, I mean, the one thing I'm really good at is texts. You know, I can tell one kind of text from another. It's so clearly a historical uh, story. Right. It, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of things they're finding? Uh, in, in well, this? It, it just, it, it becomes endless. I mean, I wrote this book. Uh, you know, came out, whatever, months ago, and already there's stuff that I want to add to it. Huh. I've had people on my radio program, if you go to the Eric Metaxas show, well, we're on Rumble, I interviewed a guy, uh, and, and this had just come out when my book was just going to print, but they found, uh, uh, it's Scott Stribling, an archaeologist, who found cursed tablets uh, on the top of the mountain where Joshua it says in scripture clearly that, that, you know, he did this on this mountain, whatever. They found the tablets. Hmm. You know, this is like, well, this is pretty on the nose. It's ex this is exactly it. I had a guy in my program recently, Doug Petrovich, who has done work. This is really astonishing. And I am going to write another book, which is kind of a follow-up where I get into this stuff. But he has found 
Egyptian hieroglyphics that clearly are the antecedents to Hebrew alphabetic letters. In other words, he has found a link, a link, I mean, it, it doesn't get clearer than that. So you have all these theological um, liberals who say, oh, there's no connection between Egypt and there's no evidence that the, the Jews were in Egypt. And This guy has found tons and tons of evidence, but the most interesting to me is that he shows how the Hebrew alphabet derives directly from the Egyptians. So when, you know, when you've got Joseph in Egypt and Manasseh and whatever, that, that they would have been at the, the top level of society at trying to figure out. Anyway, everywhere you look, you find stuff like this. And so some of it is, is in my book. More of it is coming out. And the funny thing, Andrew, is that, look, this is real. This is true. So we're only going to find more evidence. The evidence yeah. continues to, to, to come out. And, I, and I, it's an exciting time because as our faith is challenged, I think more and more evidence comes out where you say, listen, um, <laughs> we didn't have this evidence 30 years ago, 50 years ago, but it has now become you know, disturbing for somebody who's stuck on a, on a secular narrative. Yeah, yeah. You know, can you talk, you know, one of the things that you, this great advantage you have is you're very articulate, you're a, a Yale, you come across as a Yale, you know, you can tell that you're not, you're not, you know, what they, the way they try to uh, portray uh, religious people as, as small-minded and bigoted. And one of the th tricks I've always noticed that the press plays is you come on and you're talking about, say this, and or philo you know, theolo theology, uh, philosophical ideas and all this, and they immediately say to you, what do you think about gay people? Or, you know, what do you think, why, why don't you let, you know, do you know that when a woman needs an abortion, you know, this, this kind, and they immediately go to something that's controversial, yeah. which you're not even talking about, you know, which, and, and yeah. which maybe is another theological discussion. Right. How right. do you deal with the press when you're, when you're facing off with them? I, you know, I don't know how much I deal with the press. And one thing that I have learned over time is you don't waste your time talking to people who aren't actually interested in the truth. In other words, mm. if somebody wants to play a gotcha game, Play it with some other sucker because I'm not going to waste my time, God's time, your time. If people are interested in the truth, we can have a conversation. But there are plenty of people that are there. That's the last thing they're interested in. They have a narrative. They have an idea and they just want to make you look bad or whatever. But I I tend simply to avoid those people because, yeah. frankly, I don't respect them. How can I respect you and take you seriously if you're not really willing to to dig into stuff? We should be interested in what is true. You know, let's reason together. Let's try to figure out what is true. And if I've missed something, let me know. Or if you don't like something I say, let me know. But let's at least try to be honest. But it does, it fascinates me how uh, people pretty quickly reveal themselves not to actually be interested in in what is true. They, they just, they're just annoyed that you might believe it. So they're trying to make you look bad. And so I, I, I do my best to avoid those people. Yeah, that's smart. It is. I, you know, can you, we're talking to Eric Metaxas about the book, Is, uh, is Atheism Dead? Can you talk a little, I don't, I don't want you to rehearse your entire life or anything like that, but, but can you talk a little bit about how you lost your faith and found it? Uh, yeah, oh, sure. I, I think, you know, I don't know if I ever lost my faith. I, here's the way I would put it. I was raised in this house. Uh, this is where I am. I'm in Connecticut, Danbury, Connecticut. Um, and like a lot of people, you know, my mom came from Germany. My dad came from Greece. Uh, they met in an English class in New York City. Working class European immigrants thrilled to be in America. So I was raised in the Greek Orthodox Church. And for me, religion, faith, whatever it was, it was mostly an ethnic identity, right? I realized I didn't know what I believed when I went to Yale University because there suddenly you're any anybody who has any kind of a biblical narrative that you're going to be challenged. Everybody knows those people are crazy. That's flyover country. We're the cultural elites. We're secular, whatever. So I never really renounced what little faith I had, but I kind of drifted. And if you drift and you're not sure what you believe, if you imbibe the, you know, the, the, the cultural attitudes, which I did, I didn't become a strident atheist, but I was sure that I had no clue what what's what. And it wasn't until I was about, I'd been out of Yale, it was like or about four years, I was really lost. Uh, I was so lost that I moved back in with my parents in this house, you know. And if your parents are working class European immigrants, they're going to look at you like, why are you here again? We didn't have food when we were growing up. 
Uh, we didn't get to go, to go to college. You went to Yale. We put you through Yale working menial jobs. You get, so why are you here, like, looking for the meaning of life? You know, and, and my friend's parents would be like, oh, Eric's trying to find himself. And my parents would be like, yeah, Eric should find himself a job. <laughs> like, that's the goal. Find a job and move out. So I really went through this, you know, everybody I was hanging out with mocked the idea of any kind of serious faith, much less, you know, political conservatism, whatever. I was in that milieu. That was just the world that I was in. But when I came back to this house in Connecticut and lived with my parents, I, I was away from my friends. I had time to think. And I was miserable. And in my misery, I opened just the tiniest crack to the idea of faith, but not much. But if you suffer, it focuses you. Uh, and there was a guy who came into my life. I had a horrible job. You know, what kind of a job do you get with a Yale degree, Eric? Well, I'll tell you what I got. I got a job as a proofreader at Union Carbide in Danbury, Connecticut, which is about as hellish as anything you could imagine. You know, as the editor of the Yale Humor Magazine, I'm writing short stories and poems. And, you know, I have a job now in corporate culture reading medical, I'm sorry, chemical manuals. It was, it was so miserable. And in the middle of this hell comes a graphic designer who was a man of faith. And every now and again, he'd share a little bit with me. And I, I was in enough pain to be a little bit interested, but I was inoculated against like, you know, these are crazy people. They believe the Bible. I don't want to, you know, well, this went on for months and months. And then one night around my 25th birthday, I had a dream. Uh, it was unlike anything I had ever experienced. It was utterly and undeniably miraculous and in the dream i won't tell it because it's a little complicated but pe people go to my website there's a video where i tell the story ericmetaxas.com but um jesus made himself known to me in the dream in a way that left zero room for doubt it's like now game over you know suck on that eric you don't like it <laughs> your friends are gonna are gonna throw you under the bus your life is ruined but now you know ha have fun so I, the next day, knew that I knew that what I wasn't even sure it was possible to know. In other words, I, I kind of thought, well, maybe God exists, but no one with a brain would say, I know that he exists, or I know the Bible is true. Well, the next day I knew, and I thought, well, now I'm going to have to read some books and try to make sense of what I know, because I don't know what I'm going to tell all my Yale friends and my Manhattan friends and my literary friends are going to, they're going to think I'm nuts. And many of them did, but... You know what? Uh, there's not much you can do about that. And I think it takes time, but eventually you, you, you make peace with the fact that truth is truth. I know what I know. If there's some people who have a problem with that, it really is their problem. And I have to, I want to be loving and be there if they have questions, but I cannot lead my life worried about what they think because there's this character named God who created heaven and earth. I'm concerned with what he thinks. You know, yeah, that's yeah. that's kind of my priority. A, a great story illustrates everything we've been talking about on the show about the the emperor's atheism is the emperor's new clothes. Eric Metaxas, the book is Is Atheism Dead? It's great to see you. Uh, come back when the new book comes out, and hopefully, maybe we'll meet up in New York before that. I would love it. Thank you, my friend. All right, great seeing you. All right, we are winding down. The Clavenless week is approaching, kind of like a, a freight train. If you st happen to be standing on the tracks or a truck if you're in the middle of the highway. Uh, you know, it's it's going to be a disaster, but at least you're going to go into the darkness with no problems because first, there's the mailbag. When we talk about the children of the community, they are a children of the community. Yeah! <laughs> He's an endless source of, of wisdom, that woman. All right, from Ben, I, I have to answer this question, and then I think I'm going to leave this topic alone, but I, I, can't, I get so many emails about this still, and still people bring it up on Twitter and things like that, so I have to answer it one more time. It is worth going back to it. This is from Ben. He says, thank you for picking my question. I'm curious to hear more about why you say a woman could never beat a man in a sword fight. It's a silly subject to continue debating, but it does seem like you have a strong stance that may need further clarification 
clarification. Many in the historical European martial arts community have asked for clarification on your view of women in sword fighting. It's apparent to them and myself that the question comes down to strength and skill. A woman who has trained extensively with a sword could easily defeat a man who had no or little skill, even if he had superior strength. There's no question that strength plays a huge role in any martial art, but sword fighting is somewhat unique in that there is a force multiplier of the sword. I'd like to put this matter to rest and would like you to consider this viewpoint for all the nerdy lowlife fans who keep asking, such as myself, Shadowversity on YouTube and many more. Thanks again and God bless. And of course, let, let, let us deal with this. First, it, it, this came out of The Witcher. Uh, the Witcher had a really good story. A woman trades her power to bear children for the power of magic. That is a resonant real story. And I was completely wrapped up in it and really enjoyed it. Not the second season, which was garbage, but the first season, which was really good. And then in the middle of it, this witch who we're really following with her, her uh, dilemma, which is a really human uh, woman's dilemma, uh, suddenly she gets in a sword fight, which she has no power to do. And she takes out these two guards, I don't know, two or three guards, and she's dueling with them. And, and I just said, you know, that's ridiculous. She'd be killed in an instant. Now, what I'm not, to, and by the way, I, I don't mind movies like Wonder Woman because that's the rule of that story. She's Wonder Woman. She has magic powers. I don't mind her winning fights and, and doing magical things. That's the rule of those stories. It was not the rule of the story I was watching, so it was bad storytelling. Now, I was not talking about a sports duel, right? Obviously, in a, in a sport with a referee and technique, where technique matters for everything, there's some level of skill and not skill where a woman could defeat anybody. You know, I mean, this is, you know, I, I played, I didn't play a game, but I rallied with a 15-year-old girl in tennis. Now, I'm a terrible tennis player. I loved playing tennis when I could, but... But I, I was terrible, and I, I could never have beaten her. 15-year-old girl, I was an adult male. I would never have been able to beat her uh, in that thing. And it didn't bother me because she had this superior skill. However, however, when the Williams sisters, Serena and Venus, played the 203rd ranked man. Now, Serena and Venus are not just good tennis players, right? They are the best, among the best uh, female players who have ever played the game. And no, there's no question about that. They played the 203rd ranked man. Right, he beat them. He didn't just beat them. He devastated them. It was six two six one. I think he destroyed them. One one of them he beat six one, and one of them he beat six two. And a racket, by the way, is also a force multiplier. Right, but we're not talking about a game. We're talking about war. Right. This is and this is important. The, when you're fighting a guard, when you're fighting a soldier, you're fighting other soldiers. Right, and you're a knight fighting other knights. <laughs> they are going to be at least the 200 ranked male in the sport. And there's not any rules and there's nothing, you know, there's no dirty fighting. There's nothing like this. So I, I was watching this film, really good film, by the way, The Last Duel with Adam Driver and Matt Damon. And they get in a duel and there's very realistic uh, uh, battles, medieval battles in it, and very realistic sword fight at the end. Now, obviously, I've never, none of us has ever seen a medieval sword fight, but I have seen a lot of fist fights in, in bars and other places. And I think this is a very realistic depiction of what this is like. Just take a look at this for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's, based, it's based on a true story, and I read the book, and there is a description of the sword fight, and there's a pretty accurate description. A, a lady in that, he would not just kill you if you were a lady in this fight, no matter how good a duelist you were. He would not just kill you. He would vaporize you to get to the person on the other side, okay? Now, why does this matter? Why does it matter to me, okay? It matters to me because if you write a story with a woman hero who is not a woman, she's not a woman hero. You know, I was talking earlier on the show about this terrific book I'm reading uh, called uh, Desperate Remedies about psychiatry and, and the butchery that psychiatrists committed on helpless people. Now, in one of these guys was a guy named Cotton, and he was just pulling people's body parts out with this stupid theory that infection was causing um, 
it was causing mental illness. And eventually people started to complain and they wanted it investigated. So, of course, they went to his mentor, who was also a powerful psychiatrist, to, to debunk it, which he was never going to do. And the mentor said, I don't have time to do this, but I'll send my assistant, who was a young woman named Phyllis Greenacre, okay? And Phyllis Greenacre went out and she studied what he was doing. She came back and she said, this is, and she said it in very scientific, cold language, but she said, this guy's just killing people and it's not doing anything. Nobody's being cured, he's just killing people. So there was a meeting, Phyllis Greenacre and this guy Cotton, who was now an important man and much older than she was. She was a young woman and he was much older than she was and he was an important figure. And her boss, who was Cotton's mentor, right, Meyer, three days they met over this report that Greenacre put forward. And he just bullied her to change this report, Cotton. He just bullied her and bullied her and bullied her. And she did not budge. She would not give an inch. Now, I'm tearing up now when I'm telling the story, but I was tearing up when I'm reading this because that is a hero. That is what a woman hero looks like. If you wrote that script and said, yeah, and then he, she punches him, I'm gone. I, lo- I leave the theater. That's what a woman hero looks like. And so if you're not telling the story, the, the, a true story and that has some truth in it, um, you, you know, you, you lose me and I think you should lose everybody, not just, you know, not, you shouldn't just be politically correct. You should lose everybody. I just want to end with this, however, okay? When I said this originally, the usual left-wing palaver came out, the name-calling and the, you know, uh, personal insults and all this stuff. And it was bullying. It's bullying me, and that's a waste of your time, I can tell you. I can tell you from my whole life, you know, like the people have tried to bully me, that, that is a waste of your time. And so I responded, as bullies deserve to be responded at, by laughing at them and telling them to, to get bent, Right. But the one thing that does concern me about this is I don't want any of these lady sword fighters to think that I don't honor their commitment to excellence and their athletic ability. I I love excellence in all things. I I actually like women's tennis better than I like men's because it's slower. uh, I'm not a big fan of the Williams sisters because they play, they're so strong, but I, I like it because it's slower, because it's more strategic and I can follow it more easily. But I honor excellence in all things, and I, of course, honor it in a woman who is a sword fighter, and I would certainly never want to be in a, in, in a duel with her. I mean, that's not my point at all. My point is this. <laughs> when you set the rules of your story and then you break them, and when you, set the, you put forward a realistic female character and suddenly she's fighting a, a sword battle, you are not fulfilling the rules of excellence in storytelling. And that's what I do for a living. And I am going to call that out every time. I'm not insulting women by telling the truth about them. I am honoring women by telling the truth about them. And I'm saying, when you want to write a story about a heroic woman character, it's actually harder. It's actually harder to do that because she is going to lose a fight. She is going to lose a fist fight. And when instead you do this weak thing that I see in movies over and over again, and you have a woman punch a guy and he goes flying butt over tea kettle out the door, which is in like a dozen movies, I just think, you know, I don't, I certainly don't want my daughter thinking that. I, I'm, I'm a black belt. I trained in the martial arts and they would tell women, if you get one hit in and run, run. Because if he's bigger than you, all the martial arts in the world are not going to help you. So that's, that's all I'm telling you. The truth matters. It matters even when you're doing fiction. I think it matters more when you're doing fiction because fiction is a way of telling a truth that can't otherwise be told. So that's, that is my response to this. Used up my mailbag section, but I'm not going to talk about it anymore because it's, it's ridiculous. And with that, we sink like a, a, a ship with a gigantic hole, like it's a ship that's hit an iceberg, we sink into the Clavenless Week. It's like, <laughs> we are sinking into a world of like emptiness and without solace, without comfort. Uh, but for those few of you who crawl across that desert of darkness, uh, we <laughs> we'll be back. We will be back next Friday with the Andrew Claven Show. I'm Andrew Claven. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Lisa Bacon, executive producer Jeremy Boring, our supervising producer is Mathis Glover, production manager Pavel Wadowski, editor and associate producer Danny D'Amico, our audio is mixed by Mike Cormina, animations are by Cynthia Angulo, hair and makeup is done by Cherokee Hart, our production coordinator is McKenna Waters, and our production assistant is Jacob Falash. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. CBS News admits that the boosted 
are catching COVID at a higher rate than the unboosted. Ohio approves a bill to arm teachers. And parents are now bragging about transing their two-year-old. Go check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.